Coming up, a new personal turboprop. A new policy for diabetic commercial pilots and drugs by drone. And getting a leg up on an aviation career. The OPA Live this week begins in just a moment. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Melissa Rudinger. It's been a long time coming, but finally, great news for folks with diabetes who want to fly for a living. Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow announced that the FAA is establishing a protocol so that people with insulin-dependent diabetes can get a first or second class medical special issuance medical. I think it's going to be a really good policy and that's going to get a lot of pilots who have been been excluded from uh, commercial flying it's going to get them back in the airplane and and making a livelihood for themselves and it's you know that's that's a win-win for everybody faa just published the new protocols in the federal register the public has 60 days to comment the faa's action for first and second class medicals was built on pioneering work aopa did more than a decade ago for diabetic pilots seeking a third class medical 1996 was when that policy changed, and uh, AOPA is, was instrumental in that as well. And uh, I can re remember uh, driving all over uh, the Middle Atlantic doing, uh, doing educational forums with uh, members of the American Diabetes Association. And uh, so we did our part to lobby for that change uh, pretty extensively. And uh, to, to date, uh, I don't think there's been a single medical incapacitation as a result of uh, pilots flying under a third class special issuance for insulin treated diabetes. And that's what FAA's Civil Aerospace Medical Institute concluded after studying the records of diabetic private pilots. That and changes in medical technology such as continuous glucose monitors finally made the FAA comfortable with certifying pilots who have insulin treated diabetes. In the long run, insulin-treated diabetics are just going to be much, much healthier, not just in the pilot population, but uh, throughout the, the general population with using CGM because it, it just controls those, those peaks and valleys of blood sugar and just allows them to stabilize and normalize their blood glucose levels so that you know, their, their risk for having problems is just going to be diminished. So it's, it's a good thing for everybody. So a combination of advocacy and technology. It's great. It's wonderful to see the FAA stepping up and acknowledging uh, the technology has changed and the treatment for diabetes has changed and, and also recognizing the success we've had with third class uh, medical uh, for, for diabetes, diabetic pilots. So it's, it's uh, like, yeah, like Gary said, it is a win-win. Opens up the door for a lot of folks. It does. Wonderful. And now the government has something new for you, space weather. Now this is serious because what happens out in space can have significant impact on your flying. Solar eruptions can disrupt GPS and high-frequency radio communications. There's increased radiation danger to aircraft occupants, particularly at the flight levels. Adverse space weather can even interrupt electric power systems. And now the National Weather Service will start issuing space weather advisories and updates as conditions require. And while more information is almost always good, sometimes there are things you don't want others to know, like when and where you're flying. So the FAA is going to make it possible for you to fly incognito with a third-party call sign that can't be connected back to your aircraft registration. ADSB transmits a unique aircraft ID that's recorded in your registration, allowing sites like FlightAware to show your aircraft path. Now this private mode will only work for aircraft using a 1090 megahertz ADSB transmitter. In other words, an extended squitter transponder and it is can only be used in the U.S. The new system will become available around the first of the year. A storied ag plane manufacturer is celebrating a new start. Thrush Aircraft filed for bankruptcy in September and laid off more than 100 employees. The company has now finished restructuring and has a new CEO. The Georgia company is known for its rugged aircraft used in agriculture and firefighting. And there's a new single engine turboprop on the market as well. Epic Aircraft says it has just received FAA type certification for its E-1000 all-carbon fiber aircraft. The Bend, Oregon company says it has 80 confirmed reservations for the new turboprop with seven airframes already under construction. 
Drones have proven valuable in natural resource management, but the Department of Interior can't fly them, at least if they're Chinese made or have Chinese parts. That's the order from the Secretary of the Interior, fearing they might pose a threat to national security. All of the department's drone fleet, more than 800, is grounded by the order, and the Senate has passed a bill that would force all federal departments to stop using Chinese drones. Interior used drones for monitoring floods and fires, inspecting dams, and tracking endangered species. The news comes even though the department's Office of Aviation Services had done a thorough evaluation of DJI drones modified for the interior's use and didn't find any evidence that they were secretly sending data back to China. And speaking of groundings, several CAL FIRE aircraft have been grounded in the last few weeks because of drones illegally flying over wildfires. The aircraft had to land during crucial moments in the firefight to ensure that this, the safety of the pilots flying. Firefighting aircraft fly just a couple of hundred feet above the terrain, so drones pose a major risk. CAL FIRE has a simple message for drone operators. If you fly, we can't. The penalties for interfering with wildfire operators are severe, hefty fines, and potential criminal prosecution. The first commercial delivery by the world's first commercial drone airline. Last Friday, UPS delivered prescriptions from a CVS pharmacy right to patients' homes. The drones fly by themselves, but a remote pilot did monitor the flights. The UPS drone airline has made thousands of flights across the Wake Med Hospital campus. Friday's flights were the first residential deliveries. And this week, Uber Eats unveiled its latest design for a food delivery drone. It can carry dinner for two people. Uber's plan is for the drone to pick up food from a restaurant, fly to a staging area where an Uber driver will pick up the dinner and drive it the last mile to the hungry customer. Tests are planned for next summer in San Diego for those nights when you're just too lazy to get off the couch and drive to McDonald's. And across the country in New York, firefighters and cops were testing and training with drones. More than 100 first responders from all over the state responded to the invitation to fly together and share what they've learned about the best ways to use drones to save lives and property. Jim Moore reports. It's been more than a decade since the last manned aircraft landed at Oneida County Airport here in upstate New York. On a windy day in late October, it went to the drones, with firefighters and police officers converging from all over the state for hands-on training and peer-to-peer -peer networking. This event is strictly um, for us to network, learn, share ideas, and have a good time. Safety is first, though. Today we're at the State Preparedness Training Center in Oriskany, New York, and we've set up a couple different scenarios. We have a rubble pile, we have a search and rescue scene, we have an indoor tactical mission scene set up, and uh, these pilots will be able to fly several different missions over several different scenarios today. And they'll be able to learn from other public safety officials that have been doing it a lot longer and some of the best pilots in the industry. You know, the idea came up several months ago, and uh, we've just been plugging away and putting it together. Don't be doing this. Drone newcomers and less experienced pilots learned tried and true techniques. Everything from thermography to the easiest way to calibrate that compass. Part 107 doesn't require actual any flight time. All you need to do is take a written test. Uh, we would love to see some flight time be included in that certification. And events like this will help allow these pilots to get some training and get some flight time in a scenario that's controlled but pretty lifelike and allow them to, to be better prepared when, it, when the real life scenario does occur. We have never done an event like this before, but we plan on doing more of these events. Again, public safety is an area where we see early adoption of these types of missions, and we want to help enable that and make sure they're doing things safely and doing things right. In Oriskany, New York, I'm Jim Moore, AOPA Live. Really good things happening. Yeah, pretty amazing. Interestingly, I just happened to be flying by that neighborhood uh, this week, uh, landing in Rome, and um, I saw the airport, and I saw the stuff down there, and we had to actually get delayed. They kind of vectored us around a little bit because there were drones operating, um, so they had to kind of uh, vector us around a little bit while they got them back on the ground, I guess. Oh, but, interesting. Uh, but you know, so, yeah. Yeah. We're a small community. We are a very small community. <laughs> Lots of stuff happening. When we come back, converting a military pilot to piston power. And money to fly.
Welcome back. It's one of the greatest challenges the industry has. It's one we've talked about a lot, how to get enough young people into aviation careers so that we can meet the increasing demand for pilots and technicians. AOPA Live's Josh Cochran has the story about an event in Leesburg, Virginia that's giving students a major head start towards aviation careers. There's no shortage of opportunity here. At the Leesburg Aviation Career Expo, over $350,000 of scholarships are being handed out to high schoolers from around the country. Hundreds of students came out to this Virginia airport to see a variety of aircraft and learn about all the career opportunities in aviation. Chelsea Montgomery came all the way from Minnesota and won a $5,000 scholarship for flight training. I don't have family in aviation, so this is uh, really unexpected, and I, I love planes when I was younger, so commercial pilot's the ultimate goal. And many of the winners have ambitious plans for the future. I want to do something that will really make an impact, do something that will really like change the way that we think of aviation. The students are also learning from mentors who are a few steps ahead of them, like U.S. Navy fighter pilot Lieutenant Megan Flanagan. If you want to achieve anything, you need to, number one, be willing to work hard, and number two, you have to believe in yourself. The expo is making a difference, encouraging the next generation to pursue aviation. Many lives have been changed um, over 14 years through this event. We have a lot of scholarship winners that have gone on to do some great things, whether it's working for NASA or flying for the airlines. We have uh, many students that have gone into the military, some that we've helped get through their flight training that came back. We had student speakers today that came back and gave their testimonies, and it's just super exciting to see the success. In Leesburg, Virginia, Josh Cochran, AOPA Live. What a great event. I, I don't know about you, but it feels like we're reaching a tipping point. I mean, we've always had programs to help young people, right. but now we're really putting the rubber on the road with scholarships and all that stuff. Our You Can Fly program, Women in Aviation, right. these events, just, I don't know, if maybe I just was in the dark, but. Right, no, you're right. There's a lot more scholarship money available these days. Um, and because people recognize, companies have recognized the need to help students uh, become aware and also get through the flight training process, so yeah. A lot of money available, including, uh, as you mentioned, from Women in Aviation, that other scholarship opportunity. Women in Aviation International will be awarding more than $600,000 in scholarships at its convention next year in March. But listen up, the deadline for the application is November 12th, coming right up. And you must be a member of Women in Aviation to apply. And, oh, by the way, you don't have to be a woman to be a member. More than 100 individual scholarships are available in areas ranging from aerospace to engineering, from maintenance to flight training. Many type rating scholarships also available. More information is at the web address there on your screen. Great recognition this week about the effectiveness of the AOPA You Can Fly program. American Airlines is offering grants to high schools who are using AOPA's You Can Fly aviation STEM curriculum. American Airlines Flight Education grants funds to help creative ideas aimed at growing and diversifying the next generation of aviators. Grants of up to $25,000 per school are available. And speaking of STEM, more than 300 teachers and administrators will be gathering in Denver next week for the 2019 United Airlines AOPA High School Aviation STEM Symposium presented by Boeing. That's a mouthful. It's two full days of great information and interaction on how to build aviation STEM programs. They'll have some great keynote speakers and you'll be able to watch the presentations live on our YouTube channel. And finally, ever wonder what it takes to turn a military pilot into a civilian pilot? The AOPA Flight Training Experience CFI of the Year has made a business out of that, but it's more about a love of flying. I started uh, mill to atp uh, as a way to purchase an airplane and teach my little girls how to fly, uh, and that's just the truth. Uh, it's been a labor of love, absolutely, and I've loved every minute uh, that I've spent out here at the Goldsboro Airport. Chris is a former F-15 Strike Eagle pilot, and he currently flies for an airline, so he really understands what it takes to t take off the military uniform and put on first officer stripes. I think Yogi Berra said it best when he said, we just don't know what we don't know. And I think that sums up the military pilot transition. Um, they're, they're absolutely fantastic at the missions and roles that they fulfill as military aviators, but every one of those is very nuanced and specific. And so um, our course, I think, does a great job of preparing them not only to be uh, first officers of major airlines, uh, but more well-rounded aviators because we do certainly tackle subjects that they've not been exposed to. Moving from a military machine to a small piston engine airplane can be an interesting transition for sure.
I, I call it a week of degraded ops. Uh, it's not just a partial panel approach, it's an entire week of learning to spell far aim. Many of these pilots uh, have never flown a piston powered airplane. The turbo piston airplane presents its own unique challenges. Uh, and then certainly the negative transfer from, from whatever airplane they've been flying for a lifetime does play a role into the transition as well. Uh, pilots that come from, from big airplanes uh, will try and flare at 50 feet, and you certainly can't do that in a Piper Seneca too. Uh, and fighter pilots, uh, most of the time, they, they lack a solid understanding of rudder and aileron input when it comes to crosswind landings, for example. Kresge says F-18 pilots haven't flown on ILS since pilot training. They're used to watching the ball. Anyhow, pretty cool stuff. It is. I, I remember working at a flight school in the 80s and yeah. uh, um, before AOPA career here, and occasionally we'd get military pilots to come in that were highly offended when we wanted them to do a check ride before <laughs> running an airplane or a checkout. <laughs> right, yeah, flying a 152 <laughs> is not, fly, not like flying an F-15 it, for sure. It is not. <laughs> Well, that's a wrap for this week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we love to hear from you. Comment on our YouTube channel or send us an email. The address is on the screen, and we hope to see you again next Thursday for another edition of AOPA Live This Week. <laughs>